Hello, everybody. I hope you're doing well as we uh, enter into the last couple weeks of the semester. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit today about Christianity in Ireland. So if you ever find yourself in Dublin, Ireland, make sure that you take the time to visit Phoenix Park. Phoenix Park is this enormous, beautiful green space. It's almost 2,000 acres. It's uh, the largest public park in any city in Europe. We got to visit it a few years ago on the humanities tour. And there are a number of fun things to see in this park. There are the fallow deer who roam through the park. There are a number of old castles. Uh, but one of my favorite spots in the whole park, one of the most moving spots uh, in that space, is this towering white cross that overlooks a, a wide open meadow where some of the deer graze. And at the base of this cross is a plaque commemorating an event that took place on that site in 1979. Pope John Paul II, who had recently become the Pope, stood on that site and he celebrated mass for an estimated crowd of more than one million people. That is a, a staggering number of people to be gathered in one place for any reason. Uh, and when we think about that number of people coming together to worship, it's incredibly moving. And it prompts some questions. Chief of which is, how did this island, Ireland, which had once seemed like such an isolated backwater when compared to a lot of other places in the Roman Empire, how did it become home to such a rich and vibrant Christian tradition? Well, today we're going to look at a couple of things. First, we're going to look briefly at how Christianity took root in Ireland, and then we'll look at some of the distinctive characteristics of Irish Christianity some of the ways that this tradition took shape from very early on. And this exploration begins with a very important figure, certainly one of the most important figures in the history of Ireland, Patricius, whom we know today as St. Patrick. Now, when I say the name St. Patrick, it's likely that the first images that pop into your head are something like this, or maybe this. St. Patrick has by and large become most closely associated in our minds with a holiday, and in particular, a holiday that is usually characterized, as a lot of holidays are, by fun and frivolity and, to some extent, excess. Green clothes, green hair, rivers dyed green, beer dyed green, leprechauns and shamrocks all around. But the real story of St. Patrick is even more interesting than any St. Patrick's Day party or St. Patrick's Day parade that any of us have likely ever seen. It's a story that begins in the late fourth century when Patrick was born in Britain, uh, probably in about 390 or a few years before that. So this is right around the time that Christianity was being accepted as the official religion, more or less, of the Roman Empire. It was just a couple of decades before the sack of the city of Rome itself. And when I say that this exploration of the history of Christianity begins with, with Patrick, that doesn't mean that there were absolutely no Christians in Ireland before this time. Uh, but it does mean that uh, the religion was far from established there. Some people living in Ireland had certainly heard about Christianity. Some were undoubtedly practicing Christianity. But there was nothing like a firmly established church in Ireland before the arrival of Patrick. I should say before the second arrival of Patrick, because the first journey that Patrick took to Ireland was not as a missionary or as a leader of the church, but rather as a hostage. Patrick spent his childhood somewhere near the western coast of Roman Britain, and he was part of a religious family. His father was a deacon and his grandfather was a priest. This was before priests were expected to be celibate. But by his own accounts, Patrick did not receive a religious education as a kid. He would later claim that he knew not the true God. He would say that his knowledge of scripture was sorely lacking because of these gaps in his, his education early on. Well, sometimes, sometime in Patrick's teenage years, he was kidnapped uh, when he was about 16 years old, perhaps with, about, uh, with, with a few thousand other people from his region. Uh, by a group of Irish pirates. It's possible that the leader of these pirates was an Irish king known as Neil of the Nine Hostages. But really, it could have been any one of a number of Irish chiefs who were 
engaging in this sort of kidnapping and human trafficking in the fourth century. Well, once he made his way to Ireland, Patrick was sold to a somewhat wealthy man, a man who possessed a great deal of land and a great number of sheep. Patrick would be sent out day after day to look after the sheep. And while he was in the fields, he began to pray. He would later say that as he prayed to a God that he had not known well in his early childhood, his love and fear of that God began to increase. Eventually, he says he found himself praying a hundred times throughout the day and long into the night, waking up while it was still dark in all kinds of weather to seek out solitude, to, to offer up his, his prayers of, of praise and, and, and petition to God. And increasingly, he prayed for an opportunity to escape the land of his captivity and to once more visit the, the Roman Christian world. Well, after six years in slavery, Patrick did escape. Uh, he, uh, he had a dream in which a voice assured him that his prayers would be answered. And in a later vision, the, the same voice told him that the ship that would carry him to freedom was 200 miles away. So one day, Patrick simply got up and walked away from his enslavement. He reached the coast unharmed, and he tried to board the ship. The captain refused, but as Patrick walked away, he continued to pray, and he said the captain called him back and granted him passage with his crew. Now, Patrick's journey to freedom was not easy. After making landfall somewhere in Europe, it's not entirely clear where, accounts differ somewhat about this, uh, Patrick and the crew began journeying inland. According to the story, at one point, when they ran out of supplies, they were in danger of starvation. And the captain, who had uh, given Patrick passage on his ship, began to taunt him, saying, why don't you pray to that God of yours and get us something to eat? Well, no sooner did Patrick pray than uh, a herd of pigs came thundering by. They were able to eat their fill. Eventually, Patrick made it back to Britain. At some point, he received some religious training, and he himself will later write that he was never much of a scholar. He refers to himself later as Patrick a sinner, quite illiterate, and the least of all the faithful. The lack of a formal education in his, in his childhood is something that Patrick always seemed to be self-conscious about through much of his adult life. But nevertheless, God had work for Patrick to do, and ultimately Patrick would respond to another vision. This vision didn't call Patrick uh, to, to run away from Ireland, the land of his enslavement and captivity, but rather this vision pointed him back towards that place. In the vision, Patrick saw a man named Victorinus. He said that this man was bringing him letters. And one of the letters was entitled, The Voice of the Irish. And when Patrick in his vision and his dream read this letter, it said, come we pray, holy youth, and walk among us once again. So Patrick answered this call and he became a missionary to the very people who had once enslaved him. In fact, after Patrick returned to Ireland in the early 430s, he is said to have converted even his former master, the landowner whose flocks he had tended as a slave. Patrick may not have been the first missionary in Ireland. He may not even have been the first bishop in Ireland, but he was certainly the most influential. There are a number of legends about Patrick and his work in Ireland, some of which are almost certainly not true which you may have heard, uh, like the story that he is responsible for driving the snakes out of Ireland. Some of these stories, though, seem at least a little bit more likely, such as the story about how he used the three leaves of the shamrock to teach about the Trinity. But even setting aside the legends, what Patrick was able to accomplish during his ministry among the Irish was phenomenal. Patrick's strategy involved um, establishing mission monasteries, uh, he would get the permission of local chieftains, and then he and his fellow monks would evangelize and teach from these monasteries. Rather than imposing something completely foreign on the people living in the area, they would often incorporate elements of the pre-Christian culture into their teaching. So they would allow the Irish to retain much of their heritage while still embracing this new religion of Christianity. It's said that Patrick helped to start uh, 
more than 300 church communities. It's said that he consecrated 350 bishops and that he baptized 120,000 people. Now, even if those numbers are slightly exaggerated, they're still remarkable. Patrick is, a, is also said to have been an outspoken voice against slavery. In fact, he was one of the most prominent figures in the Western church to be so critical of the practice. So that it's said that his influence was a major factor in the slave trade in Ireland ultimately coming to an end. And what is maybe the most amazing part of Patrick's story is that he was driven to do this by his deep love for the Irish people. Even though these people had enslaved him, even though they had taken away some of the best years of his life, Patrick poured out his energy throughout his last decades in helping these people to know God better, incorporating their culture and their stories into the faith, helping to, to give shape and life to an Irish Christianity that would continue to be a force in the world throughout the Middle Ages and even up to today. And it's this quality of love that historians point to again and again as being central to the work of Patrick. And as we look at the nature of Irish Christianity in the centuries that followed, we can still see the marks of that love in the expressions of the church that looked to Patrick as its patron saint. One of the chief marks of Irish Christianity is its commitment to mission. Just as Patrick had been, in his own words, stabbed through the heart by a burning desire to bring the gospel to the Irish people, so the Irish church that grew out of his mission had a similar desire to make disciples beyond their borders. While there were a number of Irish Christians who went out from Ireland into various parts of the pagan world, carrying with them the message of God's love, perhaps the most prominent was a man named Columba. He was born in December of 521 to a prominent family in Donegal in Northwestern Ireland. This was the region where Patrick had first been a slave. It was the region where Patrick had first returned to establish a Christian community. In fact, Columba was the great, great grandson of Neil of the Nine Hostages, the chief who some say might have been responsible for the kidnapping of Patrick in the first place. Now, by the time Col Columba was born, this region was a heavily Christianized area. And Columba, whose name means dove, as perhaps a reference to the Holy Spirit, entered into service to the church as a young man. And he became a monk and a scholar. Now, when Columba was in his 30s, he was singled out for advancement in the church. He was on his way to becoming a bishop, and he announced that instead he would remain a presbyter or an elder, which was a high office just under a bishop. Nevertheless, he continued to grow in his reputation as a studious and wise leader. His later biographer, the Dominion, will write that Columba was angelic in aspect refined in speech, holy in work, and excellent in ability, and great in counsel. He was a great student of both philosophy and literature. He was also an important figure in the work of establishing monasteries throughout Ireland. By the age of 42, he had already founded up to 40 religious communities. Had he remained in Ireland, he likely would have founded many more. But like Patrick before him, Columba would be struck by a yearning to take the work of God's kingdom elsewhere. And so in his 42nd year, Columba declared that he wished to become an exile for Christ. And he boarded a ship with 12 companions to set off on a missionary journey. His travels would take him to an island off the western coast of Scotland called Iona. This island was just three miles long. It was known by all the residents nearby to be a wild and lonely place. It's certainly a beautiful place. But despite the wildness of this place, Columba and his companions established a community there. They spent the first few years just simply praying and making themselves ready for mission, living out a quiet witness to their faith. Residents nearby started hearing about these crazy people living out there on Iona, and when they found out that several of them, including Columba, had come from wealthy families, they wondered what in the world would compel someone to make their home in that savage place. When they found out that the motivation of these monks was 
a love of God and a, and a love for the Scottish people, they were open to hearing what Columba and his fellow missionaries had to say. And so the preaching of these monks led to the conversion of the mainland Scots. Ultimately, it opened the door for Columba to minister to the Picts, a group of Celtic people living in northern Scotland. Among the stories that come out of Columba's time among the Picts, there are some powerful accounts of this missionary performing miracles of various kinds. Sometimes these miracles were mighty displays of power against the spiritual forces that the Picts embraced as part of their Druidic religion, as when he passed through a storm that a Druidic king supposedly summoned, or when he drank from a well that was allegedly cursed by a demon, or when he held a sea monster at bay using the sign of the cross. Other times, these miraculous actions involved healings. In one of these stories, Columba cured a Druid chief named Broiken of deadly illness. These demonstrations of the power of God eventually helped to win over the Picts, as they saw this, this power and Columba's love coming together in his ministry. As Columba got older, as he was unable to travel throughout Scotland preaching and working miracles, his work continued nevertheless. He spent the last years of his life in the monastery that he had established on Iona. He trained groups of missionaries, and these groups of missionaries continued to go out to preach and to serve and to establish religious communities throughout Scotland and Ireland and parts of England as well. Additionally, the monastery at Iona became an important center of learning where a large number of texts were copied and produced. In fact, the Book of Kells, uh, which is at Trinity College in Dublin, and which you uh, are likely seen in, um, in, your, in your art slides, was believed to have originated at Iona around 800 AD. In addition to being a training ground for missionaries, in addition to being a center of scholarship, Iona, because of its association with Columba and because of the great work that Columba and his fellow monks were doing, became an important pilgrimage site. It continues to be a prominent place of pilgrimage and retreat almost 1,500 years after it was first established. And this brings us to the, the second distinctive feature of Irish Christianity that I want to talk about today. It's what we might call the rich tradition of spirituality, which you'll often see referred to as Celtic spirituality. It makes sense that uh, when we think about the way that Patrick was shaped by his long hours of prayer, and given that so much of the growth of Irish Christianity was rooted in the monastic communities that the early leaders of the church established, it makes sense that spiritual practices would be at the heart of Irish Christianity. The term spirituality, and especially the idea of Celtic spirituality, is sometimes misunderstood. When some people hear about spirituality, they, they see it as a sort of escapism, a detachment or a flight from the realities of this world. But as with so much that, that we find in early Christian and monastic tradition, traditions, Irish Christians in their spiritual practices were very much engaged with the world in which they live. You've already heard of, of a couple of accounts of miraculous events in the lives of Patrick and Columba, including ways that they did battle with dark spiritual forces. Because they lived and ministered in a world that took things like demons and magic very seriously, among Druids who saw every part of the world as enchanted, Irish Christians, in their mission to that world, also took these things seriously. They saw the power of God at work in this world. They saw God's power helping God's people in all kinds of ways, from the big, as when God's spirit would help them to overcome storms and diseases, to the small, as in their daily prayer life, which included things like a prayer for the milkmaid, and a prayer for how to relate to the neighbor who is a nuisance. You can't get much more practical than that. But in addition to, to seeing this world as a battleground for spiritual forces, Celtic Christian spirituality, taking a cue from Patrick, was also marked by that quality of love that we see in so much of what Patrick and his successors did. Some of the most distinctive expressions of Celtic spirituality are characterized by a focus on beauty. First, Celtic spirituality is a mode of, of prayer and worship that takes its uh, inspiration from the created world. 
In fact, one of the reasons why a lot of people today are so interested in Celtic spirituality is that it offers ways to think about ecology and the stewardship of creation. It's possible that one explanation for this is the constant interaction between the early Irish Christians and the Druidic culture that surrounded them. It's well documented that the Druids saw nature as sacred and as Patrick and Columba and other missionaries worked among them, these ideas probably influenced the way that they presented the gospel. But it's also important to keep in mind that the love of creation exhibited by these Irish monks and missionaries was not pantheistic. It was not a worship of nature. It was a loving worship of the one who created nature. As one scholar of Christian spirituality has said, Celtic spirituality was deeply Trinitarian. So pantheism is a, is a form of spirituality that sees uh, the world as somehow identified with God, sees nature as divine. But for these Irish monks and missionaries, there was no confusion about this world, where this world came from or who was behind the holy beauty they saw in it. To borrow the words of a much later English poet, Gerard Manley Hopkins, Irish Christians saw the world as charged with God's grandeur. They saw evidence of God's glory in the trees and mountains, the streams and meadows that he had created. They saw nature as a way of understanding God more fully. A sixth century Irish missionary named Columban, not to be confused with Columba, wrote in a sermon called Concerning the Faith that if we want to know the deep things of God, we must start by looking at the natural world. And it seems that Columban practiced what he preached. According to one of his early biographers, he would call out to the creatures when he went out into the woods to fast or to pray, and they would come to him at once. He would stroke them with his hand and caress them. The wild things and the birds would leap and frisk about him for sheer joy as pups jump on their masters. Even the squirrels would answer his call, climbing into his hands and onto his shoulders, running in and out of the folds of his cow. So we see some of the same kind of engagement with the natural world that we'll see in later figures like St. Francis. This was a key piece of Irish Christianity from the beginning. In addition to its interest in beauty found in nature and its posture of love toward the created world, another mark of Celtic spirituality is in its engagement with beauty through the arts. As one scholar of Irish Christianity has remarked, in the Celtic Christian tradition, a whole culture revolved around the realization that if we love God, that deeply felt love requires expression. So in the ways that Irish Christians participated in such artistic endeavors, they were putting their faith into action so that in metal and stone and paint and wood and words and music, art was utilized to express their love for God. And we can see evidence of these expressions in the visual artifacts that early Christians left behind, early Irish Christians left behind, such as the, the Celtic crosses that dot the landscape of Ireland and Scotland, or the pages from the Book of Kells used to illuminate scripture. We can also see it in the powerful poems and hymns, many of which are used as aids to prayer and worship. One of these poems, which was set to music and used in the, has been used in the church for more than a thousand years, is Be Thou My Vision. Perhaps it's a song that you've sung before. And according to legend, the words to be thou my vision were originally written to commemorate an event from the life of St. Patrick. A pagan king in the region where Patrick was working had declared that no fires were to be lit until he lit the fire atop Terra Hill, a nearby place, in honor of, of the Druidic celebration of the spring equinox. Well, Patrick defied this order. Rather than waiting for the pagan king to light his fire in honor of his gods, Patrick lit an Easter candle to celebrate the resurrection. And because of his courage, the king supposedly let Patrick continue to minister in the area. A hundred years later, a poet named Dallin Forgall wrote a poem to honor P Patrick's act of worship. It was later translated from the original Old Irish into English, and we still sing it today. This tradition of worship lives on in the work of the community at Iona which is not only an important site for pilgrimage and retreat, but continues to be home to a group of artists and continues to produce prayers and hymns for the church to use in worship. So more than 1,500 years after a young slave boy named Patrick roamed the hills of Ireland, praying to God and longing for freedom, 
the descendants of his work in Ireland and Scotland and beyond continue to make an enormous impact in the world, demonstrating a distinctive and beautiful way to embrace the love of Christ. Thank you.